Hello, my name is Stefan Priebe and I'm going to explain Dialog Plus to you now. What is it and how did it start? The context is that all over the world clinicians meet patients. That is, it's the center of whatever we do in healthcare and particularly in mental health care. So and during those meetings they talk about symptoms, about what they plan to do, the future, or about plans. But so far there has been no model to make these meetings themselves therapeutically effective. Mental health professionals could talk, could take other models from cognitive behavior therapy and then in 10 minutes ask about, oh, how did you arrive at the conclusion that nobody likes you? Or they could take models from psychoanalysis and squeeze into 10 minutes, oh, did you have the same problem in your family with your mother or something like that? But no model has been designed to be used in that context of routine meetings. And that's where Dialog Plus came in. So our aim was to develop something for this context and to turn everyday routine meetings into something therapeutically effective. It all started with eight questions, with 11 questions. How satisfied are you with eight domains of life? Mental health, physical health, job situation, accommodation, leisure activities, partner, family, friendships and personal safety. Now these eight life domains do not cover every single problem that one might have in life. For instance, there's no specific questions on finances, although finances are obviously important. Or there's no specific question on what patients, according to the evidence, are most dissatisfied with, which is their sex life. But these eight questions are sufficient to allow patients to raise every problem they might have. So for instance, finances would come up on a job situation or sometimes under leisure activities because they don't have enough money to do what they would like to do and so on. So these eight questions cover life domains and then there are three additional questions on treatment aspects. How satisfied are you with your medication? with the meetings with clinicians and then all the rest of practical help that the services might provide. These eight questions on, on life domains reflect subjective quality of life. The other three questions are treatment satisfaction and these questions happen to have excellent psychometric properties to measure quality of life and treatment satisfaction. So they can be taken as an outcome criterion for services, but that wasn't our intention. Our intention was to improve care. So these questions rated from one totally dissatisfied to totally uh, satisfied a seven, with four being the neutral middle. Why seven points and not five or eleven or three? There's much psychometric consideration behind it, but not for now. These questions plus the question, do you need additional help in this area, were used at the beginning of, of sessions, of routine sessions, in a randomized controlled trial with more than 500 patients in six European countries. And only using those questions at the beginning of the meeting did improve quality of life, treatment satisfaction, and, and uh, unmet needs. Now you might say, oh, that's treatment, uh, quality of life, so what? But that's actually quite a high hurdle. There are not many interventions in mental health care that can say we improve quality of life. The drug companies would love to have a drug where they could say this drug improves quality of life, but they struggle. However, the effect size was small. Now, a small effect size with such a harmless, simple intervention is still worth having. And if we had had only that trial, we would still argue that it should be widely implemented, but the effect size was small. Why? Probably because we left it there. We asked clinicians and patients to rate, their, um, to rate the satisfaction with life and treatment uh, aspects, but we didn't equip clinicians for what to do if patients um, expressed concerns. So if they said, look, my accommodation is terrible, or with my partner I don't get it on, uh, um, on at all, it's possible that the clinicians just said, I'm very sorry to hear that, and then moved on. So we felt we needed to find a guide to equip clinicians 
with what to do if the patient can uh, express a particular concern. So and that's where the PLUS came in. The PLUS, the Dialogue PLUS, is the guide to clinicians. That's based on much quality of life research, concepts of patient-centered communication, a bit of IT uh, development, and very much of solution-focused therapy. So based on that, we developed the guide to clinicians. So how does Dialogue Plus now look like? It all starts with a tablet. Why a tablet? A tablet can be used by the patient if they are very computer savvy, or by the clinician if the patient doesn't want to operate that. It can be passed to and fro, but you can also, also put it away and still look at that. Um, while it's on a, on a um, smartphone, it's, it's a bit too small to look at that, if it was all on a computer screen, the danger is that patient and clinician would both look at the screen rather than talking with each other. So a tablet can be used in a functional way and in a flexible way. What is seen on the tablet? It starts with this question to the patient. How satisfied are you with your mental health? And then you go through all 11 areas, the life domains and the treatment aspects, one by one. Initially, that may take a while, in repeat sessions, usually that's very, very fast. Although there's always a patient who, who struggles, saying, "Was oh, it a really a five or six and thinks about it forever?" But normally, that can get um, one uh, can go through it in uh, almost a minute. And with the additional question, do you need more help in this area? If a patient doesn't want to go into a certain area, you can skip that. But once the satisfaction question has been answered the help question needs to be answered too. And once one has gone through this, one has an overview. Now this overview alone is helpful. It would probably be helpful to all of us to have an overview or over our own life, where our strengths, where are the weaknesses, where are the current problems. Some people call it life coaching. So in this case one can look, aha, uh -huh, medication you're unhappy with, um, while it's partner and family you're, you're very happy with, um, and one can, if one wants to, comment on, on the strength. In any case, one can now compare with any previous uh, rating. A month ago, six months ago, two years ago. And only once one has done that, gone through the overview, commented on the positive uh, areas and compared with previous uh, ratings, then the patient can, a decision, can take a decision, what do I want to talk about? today. Maximum of three, um, of three areas. Normally patients take between one and two, but more than three would be too much for one, one session. If it is a first session and no comparison is possible with previous ratings, then one has to take the decision without a comparison. And once the decision has been taken, what we want to talk about today, each of these areas is addressed in a four-step approach. The four steps are then shown on the tablet and there's a little I next to each step. If one, if one has forgotten what it's about or wants more information, you press on the I and get some more explanation with examples. So it is step one, understanding. In this case, the patient has rated a two on medication. So what are you unhappy with? I, um, I, I, it's too much, I get tired all day, I don't manage to do anything, the side effects are just too much for me. Good. But now, and that is already the solution-focused aspect, what is still working? It is a two, not a one. Even if it was a one, you managed to come here today. So what is still working? Now, uh, at least I'm without um, the voices and I've managed to stay out of hospital for nine months, so that's at least something I'm, I'm content with, although, as I said, the medication is, is too much and I'm tired. Good. Next step, looking forward. What's the best case scenario? What would take you here from a two to the seven? Ideal. Ideally, I would like to be without medication and would like to live while I like anyone else without having to think of pills and without side effects and so on. Good. That's something we should keep in mind and something we should work towards. But probably nothing we can achieve within a month or two or on a short-term 
basis. So what would be the smallest improvement that would still make a difference to you? In this case, move from a 2 to a 3. Still unhappy, but less unhappy than now. So the smallest improvement would be if I wouldn't have to sleep during the day, if I could stay awake at least for the full day, that would enable me to do some work or to do something useful, so that would be an improvement. Okay. So step three, let's consider options. What could you do to achieve that? Yeah, as a patient, maybe I could set the alarm clock for eight o'clock in the evening so that I don't forget to take some, all my medication in the evening so that I can sleep off most of the side effects. Good. What can I do as a clinician? If I'm a psychiatrist, maybe I could prescribe a bit less. If I'm not a psychiatrist, I can ask a psychiatrist to prescribe a bit less. Good. What can other people do? Now, yeah, my friend who's living next door, maybe he could take me out for a walk or do a board game with me immediately after lunch when I'm the most tired so that I overcome that period when otherwise I would go to bed and I can stay awake um, for the full day. Once that has been done, then we agree on actions. So they'll be written down, very brief, so that we can remember what they, what they mean, precise and behavioral terms, if possible. And at the beginning of the next session, then, in a month's time, in two months' time, whenever it is, we review the actions. Good. That was, that was then tested in another cluster randomized control trial in which we randomized clinicians with their patients either to the intervention, Dialogue Plus, or, or the control group. The control group was an active control group. That means in the control group, they also had a shiny modern iPad. They also rated their uh, satisfaction with life and treatment, but at the end of the session. So it couldn't influence the session anymore. But the, the effect of additional attention, of additional technology, and also the effect for the psychologist of the Hawthorne effect. So the Hawthorne effect means that sometimes ratings improve just because you rate the same thing all the time. So um, they rated their quality of life all the time in both groups. So all those effects were controlled for. And we did it only for six months, the intervention every month, and the um, outcomes were assessed baseline after three months, six months, and 12 months, so six months after the end of the intervention. And that what did we achieve? The intervention group had a better quality of life throughout, so already after three months, but still after 12 months. The effect size of that improvement was at least as large as for cognitive behavior therapy. And that's something that one must let sink in for a minute, that Sending patients to a different institution or a different service with a highly qualified psychologist, and that psychologist does eight or 12 or 20 sessions of CBT, whatever they do, that even for those patients who arrive at the psychologist and agree to the, um, to the intervention and do that, does not have a larger effect than this harmless, simple intervention and routine care. We had lower levels of symptoms throughout, and after a year, patients in the intervention group had even a better objective living situation. Objective living situation is whether um, you have um, uh, regular work, live independently, and so on. Now, that took a year to achieve, because at least in London, if you, if you decide I want to change my accommodation, that is not organized in three months' time. It takes a while. You're on waiting lists and all so on. But after 12 months, the objective situation was better. And that's something that, as far as I'm aware, no other generic intervention has ever achieved. And if that wasn't enough, it wasn't just cost-effective. It saved costs. So it was cheaper doing it than not doing it. Now, as nice as it is to have these results. No, first, sorry, first some experiences, the patients, some experience of patients. The questions made me look and reflect on my life. I never addressed some of the issues that I came across here. Or 
You start improving yourself because you're aware of it now. It made me realize what I needed to do. Or it was more structured, more professional, more focused. Constructive things were being done about certain issues. And some clinician experiences. It was structured, it was easy for them also to follow what we were talking about. Or I got so much more information out of him. Or I found it the most empowering tool in the 10 years I've been qualified as a clinician, by far. It definitely changed our therapeutic relationship. By the end, really, he was very, very much in control of his own care. So I was just going to say, as, much, as nice as it is for a researcher to find such a result, it was also a bit surprising. It made us think, how is it possible that this relatively simple intervention has such an enormous effect? We don't know, but we've got at least three different potential um, explanations. Number one, it addresses patients' concerns. No, we can train clinicians to be patient-centered, and we always say you should be more patient-centered, but we can keep training them until we are blue in, in the face. But the effect in, in uh, clinicians' behavior may be limited. This intervention makes the meeting patient-centered. No way out of it. And even better, from the second or third meeting onwards, as soon as a clinician takes out the, the tablet, the patient knows this will be centered on my concerns. My concerns will be raised. No need to be worried about that. So it guarantees patient-centeredness. The next explanation. In, in England, several patients have so-called community um, uh, CPAs, um, care program approach meetings, meetings in which um, clinicians and patients and other people involved meet and they come up with a plan. And in these plans, research has shown that 8% of the actions that one agrees on at the end are for the patient and 92% are for me or other professionals. In this intervention, 65% of actions at the end are for the patient. And to me that makes a lot of sense that that is effective because as a clinician I can persuade, convince, cajole, bully, seduce patients to do something. I can't change their life. Only they can go out and be more active, make friends, look for work. So this empowers clinicians as we've seen but it also empowers patients. Now you would say that's obvious. Why don't we do that uh, in all routine meetings? Now normally when patients come with a problem and I say, look, what do you do about it? They might say, no, me, you are the expert, that's why I've come here for advice. But this intervention seems to make patients think about own options for, for actions and accept them. The third possible explanation is that it helps with communication. Although communication is the center of what we do, as clinicians we are actually not that well trained in communication. We don't get regular supervision, we don't uh, get regularly videotaped and, and improved, and often we don't know really what to do. And again, research has shown that patients often feel their concerns are not really addressed and they need to they need to raise it at the end, so clinicians don't structure that very well. This here helps us to come up with a clear plan. We know what we do, we know we address patient concerns, no need to say at the end, oh, anything else, and are you sure we have covered what's important? We, we, um, uh, we can be reassured that all of that happened. When it is implemented, there are some advantages. It delivers an assessment at the beginning, I assess what the problems are, a planning at the end with the actions that we plan for the future, the intervention itself, and an evaluation of one procedure. And this has a very important side effect, because since patients fill in the evaluation scale for subjective quality of life and for treatment aspects, one gets these outcome measures for every patient automatically. Patients in our services sometimes complain about survey fatigue. They are fed up with filling in all these scales and you never get 100% response rates, on the contrary. But here, for all patients who participate in that, 
100% guaranteed response rate for all the evaluation. The next advantage is it has very clear core principles. When one reads a um, manual for CBT, there are often or for other psychotherapies, they are thick like that. And in research, there is a there's a, a wording that, that that creates a compliance culture. You read these directories and, and oh, complicated, and what should I have done here, and, and, and so on, and what should I have done in, in session seven um, at the end, and so on. This here is the opposite. It is so simple that when I train people, when we train people, we want them to go away and say, we can do that. They will do that with different styles, different personalities, different priorities, but they can do that. And the manual for, uh, for that is very brief. It's not like a, yeah, like a manual for most psychotherapy um, uh, models. It has currently, I think, 13 pages, and that's already with pictures and redundancy. So it focuses on clear core principles. It's one has some flexibility in sessions. It's not, one can say, if there's little time, you can say at the beginning, oh, sorry, today we can talk about only one domain. Possible. It has enormous flexibility in its application. It's not a treatment in form of six sessions, 12 sessions. It's an approach. Can be used today and, in, and maybe in a month's time or in six months' time. Home treatment teams use it in an acute setting. It can be used in long-term settings. So it has a flexibility as an approach and how you, how you apply it, as long as the principles are adhered to. It's now currently implemented and tested in studies in more than 15 countries. And interestingly, when we go to these countries in global mental health research and say, look, we have got here our, um, our resource-oriented treatments like family involvement and befriending and Dialogue Plus, all of them are interested in Dialogue Plus because many countries implement community care, but they don't know what the stuff should do with the patients. And that gives them something yeah, to train and to use in practice. So far, everything is freely available. The supporting app for iPads and for Android platforms, so for tablets as well as for, for smartphones, although we, we recommend it to be used on a, on a tablet, not on a smartphone, but could be tried on a smartphone. There's a manual. All of that has been translated into more than 10 uh, languages. There's also an operational guide. If you want to assess adherence to, to the manual, there's an adherence scale. And there's also background information and all publications and everything is all freely available. And with additional information, everything can be downloaded from this website. It's not a very flashy website, but it works. It has the instructions for how to download the app and how to use it. And if that's not enough, then you can write to our team and we are happy to answer any more questions. Thank you very much.